Well, I did have a chance to talk to Warren Buffett, but I said I could talk to Warren Buffett another time and I'd rather come and talk to you. And what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about myself and frame one of the issues that I think is so important for you, for us, for America, for the world. And as was mentioned, I run an investment firm. It's literally right across the street in the Aon Center. We're on the 29th floor called Aerial Investments, and we invest $6 billion for a lot of people and organizations. I also work on television talking about money. You could say money is my specialty. I'm on a bunch of boards, including DreamWorks Animation, which is kind of cool because we go to board meetings and watch movies, which is fun. And this year, I'm actually getting married, too. So I've got a lot of stuff going on. I know, it's been a great time. And you might hear all that and think like, well, you know, I've always had it together and everything's perfect and this, that, and the other. And I have to tell you, I definitely didn't start off that way. And it's still not that way. When I was growing up, I am the youngest of six kids in my family. And in my family, I'm really young. So my oldest sister is 25 years older than me. And we have the same mother. So it's a big gap. 25 years older, so when I was growing up, my sisters made a point of making sure to tell me that I was not planned. <laughs> they did it a lot. And when you're like 25 years old, your sibling, and you're five, and your sibling says things to you like, you know, we found you by the doorstep, you actually believe them. So I had to work through that for a long time thinking that I didn't belong. When I grew up, my mom was a single mom and she struggled like a lot of single moms do, six kids. And um, we had like a really crazy life. And I say it wasn't boom or bust, it was kind of bust or normal. And so we'd either like have a place to live and things would be fine or we'd be getting evicted or our phone would get disconnected or our lights would get cut off or a car would get repossessed, or my mother, I remember this, that in order to get me to school, she would go to the gas station and ask the gas attendant if we could borrow $5 worth of gas. And so she was one of those moms who would do anything for me, but it was definitely one of these lives that was very, very challenging. But my mom also was one of these people who, she didn't always have the best money sense. So an example would be like, if it was Easter, we'd get new Easter dresses instead of paying the phone bill. And it was something that never sat with me. And so I always tell people, I do not think it's an accident that I work in the financial industry, because as a child, I was desperate to understand money, desperate. I hated the fact that I felt this insecurity around money. So I was very fortunate. I went to good schools. I went to St. Ignatius, and then I went to Princeton. And Princeton was an amazing place. And between my sophomore and junior year at Princeton, I was an intern at Aerial Investments, where I work today. And I didn't know anything about the stock market. I didn't know anything about investing. But I went and worked at this firm, and I fell in love with the business. And all of us see every single day on the radio, or we hear on the radio, or we see on television, what the Dow did, and what the S&P 500 did, or the NASDAQ. And I didn't even know what they were talking about at that point. Now I do. And it was not surprising because we don't learn about investing in school in America in most schools. And it's one of these things that boggles the mind. I always tell people that it's amazing to me that in high school today, you can take wood shop or auto as an elective and not take a class on investing. And it always leads me to ask people a very simple question. Who whittles in their spare time? <laughs> Who cleans their own carburetor, right? But you can actually take these kind of electives, but you can't take a class in investing. And that's been something that has bothered me in many ways has guided the work that I do. So after graduating from Princeton, I came to work at Ariel. I started at the bottom. And I have to tell you, it was like one of these things that was so great when I started. And this is going to sound very perfunctory, but what I loved about my work is getting a paycheck. I was so excited to be able to pay my bills. I would sit in my bed in my little studio apartment, and I would just be grateful that I knew I could pay my rent and my phone bill. And my first starting salary at Ariel was, was $35,000 a year. It seemed like a million. I felt like I was flush with cash. No, of course I wasn't. I had expenses, and you know, I had to keep a roof over my head and feed myself and things like that but it just felt so liberating to have money. And even though it wasn't a lot, it was enough. 
And I was convinced at that point, from that day forward, I would live my life very differently than how I grew up. And I would take responsibility for myself financially, so I'd never be in the situation that I felt before in that, that level of insecurity. So one of the things I wanted to do today was to shape how that has evolved from that moment when I got that job. And I wanted to do it with some quotes that I think really frame how I feel about this issue and how I feel about what has happened thus far. And I always think of these as been great lessons that I've learned. I'm one of these people who is a voracious reader, I'm sure, like many of you. And I always find myself, I always read with a pen because I was taught to do that in school or pencil. And I always find myself underlining or ripping out quotes or pages that really speak to me and I keep them on my desk and pinned up on things. And these are a few of them that actually like changed my life when I saw them. And the first one I have to tell you I found in the most unlikely place, Cosmopolitan Magazine. Very highbrow, right? But it was this quote by this woman named Judy Collins who was this folk singer from the 60s. I didn't know her, but I guess she was a really big deal back then. And Judy Collins said something that just like spoke to me. She said, as women, we are raised to have rescue fantasies. And I'm here to tell you, no one is coming. No one is coming. Now this is actually easy to think about when you think about growing up as a girl. We have a situation where we read fairy tales. All of us have read fairy tales, boys and girls. But in the fairy tale, the girl always gets rescued. I mean, Cinderella got rescued, Rapunzel got rescued, Snow White got rescued, Shrek even rescued Fiona. <laughs> and so we get hired, hardwired to believe someone will come and take care of us. And I read that quote, and it wasn't even just by being a girl or a woman. I read that quote and I said to myself, what if from this day forward I led my life as if no one were ever coming, that if I'm all I've got, what kind of decisions would I make and how would I do things differently? And it was a life-changing question. And I decided if no one is coming, you are going to take ultimate responsibility for yourself. If no government is going to rescue or no parent is going to rescue or no man or woman is going to rescue, then what decisions will you make to really be in charge of your life? And I said again, that's what I knew financially. I would make sure I was saving and I was investing and I was able at all times to support myself no matter what. No, I came to this naturally because my mom was very independent in some ways. You know, she was the single mom, but she always worked and she always taught me that anything was possible. And she very much was about making sure you could stand on your own two feet. And she always, you know, she was very clear about the fact that, you know, people will come and go. In my business, we have disclaimers when we show performance of investments. And I think about it a lot when it comes to um, relationships. In our hedge, which we have the copy on our performance, it says past performance is no guarantee of future results. When you think about that in terms of people that you might date, you think about it in terms of all the things that are going on, that led me again to have this strong belief about taking control. Now the second quote that I read was one that I really liked for a reason that became clearer to me later. It was a quote by Neil Simon and he said, if no one ever took risks, Michelangelo would have painted the Sistine floor. <laughs> now, I didn't really understand it until I went to Italy and I went to the Sistine Chapel and they explained to me how frescoes are made, which is what the Sistine Chapel is. Frescoes are, you know, you look up the Sistine Chapel, it's many stories up, and they tell you the story that when the Pope went to Michelangelo and he asked him to paint the Sistine Chapel, he originally said no. He was like, I don't want to do that, that's really hard. And the Pope said, no, you don't understand, Michelangelo being a good Catholic. He said, if you say no to me, you're going to burn in hell. <laughs> so Michelangelo said, I think I could rethink it. So he decided to do the Sistine Chapel. Now, why was it really hard? A fresco is plaster, and you paint while it's wet. And the way it works is it starts with the colors. Each color is a family. So if you're blue, you're sky blue. Your family is sky blue. Your father was sky blue. Your grandfather was sky blue. You mix a very specific shade of sky blue, and it's exactly the same every single day. And if you're yellow, you're a certain kind of yellow, et cetera, et cetera. So all the colorists are down blending the colors. 
And what Michelangelo does, he paints the design on a thin piece of tissue paper. He puts the tissue paper up on the ceiling and they take tiny little pins and they outline the drawing with the little pins. They pull the tissue paper down, now he can see the drawing. Now he takes the paint. It's wet, remember? It's plaster. He's painting, but he can't see anything. He doesn't know if it works until it dries. And if it doesn't work, they take a chisel and they chip it down and start all over. It took Michelangelo years to paint the Sistine Chapel, so many years that after he was done, they said he had a problem with his neck and he couldn't look down. So you say, well, how does this all fit into Neil Simon's quote? The floor would have been easier, right? And so I started to think about it that in terms of life, and I started to think of it in terms of investing life. And I think about especially today all of these individuals who are risk averse. They don't want to take risks. They have their money sitting in cash, which is basically making nothing. Or they say, I'm scared of the stock market and I don't want to invest. And by being scared, they actually lose out over the long term because over the long term, the stock market has outperformed all other investments. Yeah, we might have bear markets, we might have terrible times, but bull markets follow bear markets. Bear markets follow bull markets. And if you're disciplined and patient and long term in your saving and investing, you'll do fine over time. And it helps, of course, when you start really early, especially like you. So that's why in taking risks, if no one ever took risks, you'd paint the floor. Well, the same is somewhat true in investing. If you don't take risks, you actually find yourself not really getting very far. The third quote is something I read by Winston Churchill. He said it during war. He said, if you're going through hell, keep going. I read that and I was like, he is so right. How many times have you been in hell? Things have been so bad and all you say to yourself is, I've got to keep going. I've got to keep going through this. I remember when, this when I was a child. There were times we literally would have all of our stuff in a car. And I'd be sitting there thinking to myself, I just can't wait until I'm big. I can't wait until I can take care of myself. I can't wait until I can be you know, the one making sure that I'm OK. Not because my mother didn't try very hard and do everything within her power, but I just felt that if I were in control, I was going to be able to do it differently. And that's the thing about when you're in hell, you have to talk yourself through how to get out of it. Because the one thing about life, we all have our moments in hell. And the one thing I've learned, hell is not real estate that I like to occupy for very long. I only like to stay there for short periods of time. I don't want to spend extended times in hell. And you all know what I mean. We all have our version of it. It could be a bad relationship. It could be a bad test. It could be something. But there, there are times when we are going to suffer. It's just life. Now, suffering for me occurred, again, related to the stock market in the crash of 2008. It was horrific. I watched my entire life and all the work that I do, do just fall apart. I watched the stock market just bleed red ink every single day, and all of this money that we had made for clients just go away. And it was extraordinarily challenging and, and in many ways really tested my mettle. But I learned that you keep going. And we kept going, and we recovered, and we did better the next year and better the year after. And things are much better. Because again, we know that tough times don't last. Tough people do. So if you're tough and you can get through it, if you can keep going, you'll make it. And that's true of investing. It's just true of life. The last quote I learned from was from Teddy Roosevelt, great president. Teddy Roosevelt said, do what you can where you are with what you've got. For me, that meant to give. And giving is as much as a part of making money. It's as important to me. So I love the fact that I can help people make money so they can give it away. That's something to me that is really, really neat. And I think that we are all in the position to give in whatever way we choose to do. It might not be money, it could be time, it could be mentorship, it could be insight, it could be being a great friend, sister, brother, husband, wife, whatever it might be, friend at work. But doing what you can where you are with what you got was the part that spoke to me because I find a lot of people tell you why they're not doing something. When they have more money, they'll do it. When they have more time, they'll do it. When this, when that, what is wrong with now? We have a saying at Ariel that we've admired the problem long enough. It's time to do something about it. And so my version of doing something about it is I want to live in a financially literate society. And so what we've done is we started a school. Our school has a saving investment curriculum. 
We give every first grade class 20,000 real dollars to invest. And the money follows them through their grade school career. And we want to make them understand money like I was desperate to understand it as a child. And we're doing it in real life, 15 years in, 550 kids. So where does that leave me? I'm 44 years old. I know, you're thinking 44, yes, 44. 44 years old. I am not counting on being rescued, and I suggest you not count on that either. I'm hoping to create my own Sistine Chapel. When I'm in hell, I keep going, and I am idealistic enough to believe that I can make the world a better place, and I know you can too. Thank you. Thank you.